Michel, Chaim Michel, Michel asks, is John Mearsheimer, the famous international relations scholar, right that NATO expansion is the driving cause of the Ukraine crisis? Mearsheimer wrote a famous article in Foreign Affairs, I think in 2014, saying that the Ukraine crisis is really the West's fault. And he's repeated his position only a few days ago. Michelle asked me if I'd watch a video by Mirschheimer from about 2015 when he was arguing his case. And I thought about it and it's clear to me that we need a long episode to settle this debate and we can't do that now. So I actually haven't watched that video, but what I have watched is Mirschheimer's most recent sort of 20 minute statement on this current crisis. And we're going to talk about that. And um, I think that will get us not all the way there, but it'll get us to make a few steps to make this conversation really interesting. We're going to land at a conclusion that I think I want you to take very seriously as the conclusion that you might want to apply to Mearsheimer's view. So I'm going to tell you what I heard Mearsheimer say, and we're going to say a few things about that. I heard Mirsheimer say that NATO expansion is the cause and the explanation of the Ukraine crisis, um, at least substantially so. There is then always a question, how far is Mirsheimer then saying that NATO expansion isn't just the cause, but also um, is the justification of Russia's aggression? And that's always a difficult conversation because of the kind of position Mearsheimer takes in international relations. And I'm a political philosopher. I'm not really even a political theorist. I'm a political philosopher. I'm not an IR theorist or an IR scholar. But nevertheless, with the kind of position Mearsheimer takes, um, the gap between A has caused B and A justifies B for him is not very big. Another claim I'm hearing is that NATO expansion is said by the Russians to be an existential threat. I think that's clearly simply true. We don't need to discuss this. Then I hear him say that NATO expansion is an existential threat to the Russians. And again, we have this problem with John's views, which is that um, if the Russians say that it's an existential threat, that's nearly the same thing as it simply being an existential threat. What is that gap between these two things for John um, is an important question, a question we can't settle in this video. Then John says that Putin doesn't want the USSR back. And I'm going to interpret this um, like that and say that he is right about this. What I think isn't true is that Putin simply wants to get involved with Ukraine and then won't do anything else um, in the countries around Russia. That's not the case. It's rather that Putin doesn't have a clear geographical territorial aspiration into which he systematically aspires to expand, as was the case with Khrushchev or as indeed was the case with Stalin and Hitler. So... But that doesn't mean that he won't go beyond Ukraine. All that means is that there's a kind of a logic of escalation in the Kremlin, and that logic will go wherever it goes. But there isn't a territorial concept there. And because there isn't, I'm going to give a tick to Mirsheimer's position that Putin isn't resurrecting the Soviet Union. I'm so sorry about the construction noise. And then Mirsheimer says, we shouldn't have encouraged Ukraine to defend itself, like now, in February 2022 which is quite an extraordinary thing to say. So let's begin breaking this down. And the first way to at least create space for a potential critique of Mearsheimer is that you've got to ask, does the history add up? Does the recent history of NATO expansion and Russia's resp response add up? Because you see, is Russia's anxiety about NATO really Russia's anxiety about NATO? Or is that anxiety more directly correlated with democratic expansion? And then the same historical point you can put psychologically. 
in the mind of people at the top of the Kremlin, is NATO expansion more of a problem than democratic expansion, right? And so the question is, is Putin opposed to NATO being in Ukraine? Or is he really opposed to Ukraine being a democracy? And is that second thing more of a problem for him? So would democracy be okay for Putin in Ukraine without NATO? No way. Absolutely no way. Um, as long as Ukrainian citizens are exercising their democratic rights, that ain't okay for Putin. Now, is this unacceptable to Mirschheim and does this defeat his argument? I think not. I think he has responses to this and we're not going to get into this now. But we've got to get into this conversation about something being an explanation and something being a justification. If I read your comments and I get upset by them and I ban all of you from the channel and then just close my channel, well, your comments will certainly be part of the cause of you being banned from my channel and me just shutting my channel off. But we couldn't quite say it's a justification because my reaction is so dramatically disproportionate. So let's try to distinguish between four things at this point. One, Putin pretends he is worried about NATO, but he really isn't. That's a claim you hear often. In fact, some people I deeply admire come perilously close to making that claim, and Applebaum being one sometimes. And I think that there is no contest here. Quite certainly, whatever is the hierarchy in Putin's, uh, uh, Putin's reasons for getting involved uh, in this ghastly assault on Ukraine, whatever his reasons are, um, he says that NATO ex expansion is part of what he's worried about. And there is no doubt that he is to some extent telling the truth, even though he lies all the time. So Putin is not just pretending that he's worried about NATO. Putin is, um, if you think there isn't a problem there to worry about, then Putin is simply delusional. But you can't say that he's just making it up. Because as we've seen in some of the videos on the main channel, Putin even has trauma, not just outrage, but trauma that's embedded in him by his inability to process certain um, NATO military interventions, particularly those in Yugoslavia in the 90s. Second proposition. Putin is worried about NATO, but he's wrong. That's probably the most common proposition you're going to come across in a Western conversation. Third proposition. Putin is worried about NATO, and he's right. Fourth proposition, Putin is worried about NATO and in balance of power, great power politics, there is no further question about being right or wrong. And I think of the four positions, it's position four that's closest to Mearsheimer's. And position two, Putin is worried about NATO but he's wrong, is the position that probably is the central candidate of competition for Mearsheimer. Mearsheimer talked in this 20-minute presentation I heard about the Russians. The Russians want this, the Russians want that, the Russians say it's an existential threat, so it's an existential threat for them, NATO in Ukraine. Who are the Russians? Is there no difference on Mearsheimer's terms um, between a scenario where only Putin is worried about NATO expansion, nobody in his circle is, nobody in the clans around him is, they're just fearful to disagree with him, and nobody in the Russian population is. Imagine that's the case. That's not the case, but imagine that's the case. Isn't that a radically different situation to a situation where Russia has a democratically elected government? Um, that 
uh, is full of different kinds of free political actors who all believe that NATO is a threat to them? Isn't it also uh, um, different to a situation where there's a population that freely believes that NATO is a threat to them? So it matters not at all to one um, which scenario we're looking at. Let's take this a bit more concretely and historically. In the last 140 years, Russia had four chances to, to go on a much more democratic path. Two were um, over 100 years ago, one before the revolution, one in the early 1880s when the very progressive Tsar was assassinated and interestingly replaced by Alexander III, a very repressive Tsar who is a hero of Putin's, even though Putin doesn't know really left from right when it comes to making sense of Alex III. So, um, but the two most recent democratic opportunities that Russia missed came in 1991 and in 1999. In 1999, Yeltsin was passing the baton to his successor, who didn't need to be Putin. It turned out that it was Putin. And Putin in the early years wanted to uh, talk about joining NATO, in fact, and feels, again, wounded by his perception that he was dismissed. Now, imagine Russia becoming a democracy um, and progressively stabilizing democratic institutions from 1999 onwards. Would Russia then think that NATO is a threat to it? I would suggest very probably not. Let's take a different scenario. Imagine Russia didn't become a democracy, but it didn't have a, a leader like Putin. It had somebody more moderate, more modern, more open. Would they think that NATO is a threat? Let's say that this is not a democratic society. It's still a kind of hybrid informational autocracy, authoritarian regime, but much more mild, much more Western looking than Russia under Putin. Would they think NATO is a threat? Yeah, they would. Would, would they think it's as much of a threat as Putin does? No, they wouldn't. But would they have an issue with it? Would they be pissed? Yeah, I think they would. So th these are a couple of potentially helpful historical counterfactuals. Um, but we've got to be clear here. You know, what if it is only Putin who thinks that NATO is a threat? You know, um, what do we make of a situation like that? Um, can't we say that there is a difference between what uh, the Russians say um, if the Russians is just some nutty dictator versus if the Russians are a legitimate government that represents not just the people democratically, but represents the country's interests. So this is, this is where that conversation has to go. I mean, Putin now is virtually at war with his own people as much as he is at war with Ukrainians. Um, he is, you know, send down the river the futures of generations of young Russians. Even these totally frozen off mofos around Putin are freaking out a little bit at what they're seeing. So what do we do when we try to make sense of this gap between Putin says NATO is a threat and feels NATO is a threat to, 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 to the idea that NATO really is a threat? How do we how do we connect or disconnect these two things? That's where the conversation eventually will have to go. And instead of resolving it by a deep exploration, I'm just going to land this discussion. And I'll land it by mentioning what Mir Shaima said about Ukraine. He said that Ukraine um, shouldn't have been encouraged by the West in the last few days to defend itself. And that's an extraordinary claim. I think it's the claim of somebody who doesn't have a deep enough understanding of either Ukraine or Russia. Because if you are Ukrainian and you're seeing this Russian invasion, it just feels like the Nazis are back. You're going to pick up arms. The idea that Ukraine wasn't going to defend itself is an idea that Mearsheimer only shares with Putin. So what is wrong here? What's the error that's happening? The error is a kind of Google Earth view 
of reality. And from this Google Earth position, you put on these great power balance of power hats onto nations. But what happens when you get to ground level, these hats don't fit. Look at the recent video by um, my colleague here on YouTube and my colleague in philosophy, Hans-Georg Moller on his channel Carefree Wandering. He did a video breaking down Russia's Ukraine invasion using Mearsheimer's lecture. What's the most striking thing about Hans's, whatever it is, 15 minute video? There's not a single mention of Russia. That's a meaningful mention of Russia. There's no mention of the Russian regime, of how it works. You know, when you begin to look at that, what happens is that you realize there's almost no resolution on the Mearsheim kind of picture. And it just is horrifically pixelated. And no, I'm sorry, you're not going to put just some kind of vague, um, uh, you know, gray power hat onto Russia and say that explains how they behave because that's how other great powers behave. No, that's not going to happen. I mean, let's take a simple example. 30% of the cause of this invasion is Putin losing power in Russia and wanting to bring back the reins of power, confiscate it a little bit from the folks around him. Which he has done, because now that the war is going on, that is a show he gets to run. So the explanation for what's going on there is completely unavailable to us, you know? if we just approach it from the Google Earth perspective. That's where I'm going to leave it for now, but I do think that this video has stimulated some really good steps forward, but it hasn't resolved the issue. And I think to resolve it, we might need to do a, a separate systematic treatment on it, but that will require really coming to terms with particular positions in international relations theory, which we are going to have to do. Michelle? Well done for getting through to the end of this. Everybody else, thank you so much. 